I, I think as far as getting our, our upcoming assignment to South Korea, I think it was one of those things that as I switched career fields was always a possibility, but until we actually got the word um, about a month ago, or one or two months ago that it was actually happening, then it actually becomes real. And that is definitely a, a surprising, um, nervous moment. At first I was nervous and I felt overwhelmed, but I have such a peace about it now and I think that this is going to help me in the future because we really have no idea where this, you know, we used to think we knew a little bit of where we were going on our military career, um, but now with this new um, job and this a little bit of a career change, um, we really have no idea what's in store for us. I, I think I'm more cap more capable of just, just saying, hey, we just need to sit back We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. God knows what that path is. And uh, I, I think that's something I've definitely learned because God has been so good. All things work together for the good of those that love him. I think that's, that, that's a truth that I see in our lives all the time. And that really, I think, helps when there's unknowns in the future that you uh, tend to be worried about. We're in the fifth and final message in our series from the book of Nehemiah, Navigating Life's Surprises. And so as we've gone through the book, we're, we're gleaning out of it anything we can learn, receive, that we can apply to our life uh, that has direct application to guide and direct us, encourage us, empower us. And here's something we've learned. It's not just about a wall, is it? I mean, how many people here would think that, you know, I'm gonna get ready to get called out of my normal life to go do a major construction project in a place I've never been. So that's not what this is about, is it? That's what it was for Nehemiah, but it isn't gonna be that for us. But it's in the Bible for us to read so we can learn from it to inspire us where we are and where we're being led in our lives today. So we need to answer the question, and we're gonna answer it today. In Nehemiah, what did the people gain in their victory what was the transformation for them? And what do we gain in our victory? And what's transformation for us? So we've learned about transformation along the way in these last few weeks. Transformation is a fundamental change in a person's spiritual life. Like the, like the foundation blocks have been moved around. It's change in meaning. It's change in interpretation of life, self-definition, purpose, and ultimate concern. Meaning, when we're transformed, certainly by receiving Christ and the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, things have, have a different meaning. They take on different meaning for us from then forward. In our interpretation of life, what it's about, what is life for, all these things, how do we see life that changes. And our self-definition, sometimes we can do charitable things, get involved in work and, and go out and, and you know, face challenges and do things and we use those to define us now. But when we become a believer, it's different. Our belief leads us to know that we are a child of the living God, that the Holy Spirit lives within and that defines us and then we do things that we're led to do as a result of who we are. And you know what, when we're transformed in this way, it answers one of the deepest ancient of questions in human life. What's my purpose? Why am I here? And it answers ultimate concern. That means what matters most? I'm here, I have my purpose, I know what things mean, but what matters most? And we are led to understand and follow what matters most. We've also learned about victory. Victory is success or a triumph over an opponent in battle or other competition. So if you put them together, we can learn what a transforming victory is. What's a transforming victory? And a transforming victory, a transformative victory, means a contest was won and the victory resulted in lasting change. So we faced a battle or a contest. We won and things are transformed and different from then on out and that change is enduring and lasting as a result. We're also using the word surprised, surprises every week. 
And we've heard already about all the surprises Nehemiah faced. And things came out of nowhere for him. Things, this wasn't what he did as a living. He didn't go respond to calls to go build construction projects in other places. So he was surprised every step of the way. And here's some of the surprises that can come if we're hearing from God and being led to do something he's put before us to do to build the kingdom. Here's some of the surprises. Number one is the call itself. We experience victory when we understand the odds and conditions are stacked against us and the call itself may be the very first surprise. Wait a minute, I was just doing this and now you want me to, to go do that and I don't know anything about that and what the heck is this about? We're surprised by the call or the nudge, the pull, the leaning, the push. And next, obstacles confront us. I hear a lot and I can fall into this from folks saying, you know, we were pretty sure God called us to this, but then it got rough. And so we were thinking, well, maybe he didn't. Maybe, may, maybe that's not a call we heard. Maybe we weren't listening well. And then it gets even worse if we're still going because then conflicts arise. Conflict is different from obstacles. Conflict is disagreement and strife in relationships around what you're doing. So now we have the call that surprises us. The obstacles come out of nowhere. I didn't expect that. I thought it would be smooth sailing. And now there's conflict too. Well, Lord, what's going on? And you know what happens next sometimes? We're surprised by this. Our prayer can get diluted. It can, it, it can just move away from us because we can fall into this thing of, oh, Lord, thought you called us. I don't know where you are now because this, this isn't working. And we pray less and less and less. And that's a surprise. We didn't expect this to happen. And the work itself can just seem to be so big, so much, so, so over the top. It's like, I didn't expect that. This is too much. This is too big. And you put all these things together and they catch us off guard. They surprise us. They surprised Nehemiah. Every one of these and more surprised him. And yet, victory came anyway. So, so for Nehemiah, victory looked like this. The walls were built. The temple is up and running. It's restored. The covenant is renewed. The word of God is taught and followed. Sins are confessed. The poor are fed. And life is good following the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is victory. And Nehemiah speaks of it in Nehemiah 8, verse 10, when he says, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve. And here's a line from a song in the Christian world you may have heard. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Nehemiah is celebrating and rejoicing. But he's also cautioning people. Remember, we got here by following him. So then he goes on to say in chapter 10, verse 29, all these now join their fellow Israelites, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, a servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. So when we follow God, and we're surprised by these things initially, but we keep going, we can expect some rejoicing, and we can be reminded that it's by following him and what he's called us to do that these victories are achieved. There's some other surprises that come along with this. There's a surprise of what God can do in us when we let him. What he can do in us. Us, Nehemiah, a cupbearer. Not a, not a guy hired by Jewish leaders to come and do anything. Any one of us, any one of us can be used. And we can be surprised what God can do in us when we let him. Number one, we persevere and persist. Those words sound alike. They're very similar. But if you put them together, here's what we get. It means to continue on course with stubbornness. You're resilient. You're resolute. I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. My my son used to say when he played soccer at Foothill High, the only year he played, and he was most inspirational. He says, well, Pop, my mentality is they'll have to kill me. I said, well, I suppose that's useful in sports. Persevere and persist. 
And then we have this paradoxical thing that happens. Remember, we said that we can be surprised that our prayer is, it kind of eludes us and goes away. But then, as, as we have some initial accomplishments and things move forward, we can be surprised that our prayer gets deeper and more rich. Why is that? It's not about you learn how to ask for things with better wording. It's that you realize now as you go forward, he's now the God that you connect with the moment you rise in the morning and he's with you all day long. And you're just talking with him. Say, well, Lord, we gotta do this. So God, thanks for this. And Lord, okay, I got this coming. So let's, let's, get, over, let's get over that obstacle and keep moving. He becomes our partner. Our prayer deepens and intensifies. And you know what else happens? We work harder than we ever thought we could. You ever have that thing you've done in your life Build a house, try a new job, go to school, get a degree, move to another country, move to another part of the, the country you're in. And when you're looking at it, you're going, I, I, how are we going to do this? But you got to do it. So you take it a week, a day, or whatever at a time. And you're just plowing through it. Then when you're done, you stop and go, okay, that's done. And you look back. How in the world did we ever do that? What? How did we work so hard? I, how did we go without sleep? How did we do this and that? We work harder than we thought we could. We're surprised by what God can do in us. And then we work more and more with others. You might start out alone, but you're gonna find along the way if it's something worth doing, you're gonna need people. You're gonna need affiliations, friendships, coworkers, partners, prayer partners, folks you check in with, accountability partners. You're gonna need all of that. It's a big, it's a big thing. God has provided for this. More and more you're gonna work with others and then you're gonna discover strength to go against the cultural flow. Let's think about cultural flow for a minute. Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the king, Artaxerxes. This isn't just a guy with a little kingdom over here. This was a mega, huge, in incredible to comprehend kingdom with a royal presence and palace that probably defies our imagination. And the power centered in one guy doesn't exist this way anymore in royalty. It just doesn't. And Nehemiah's his cupbearer. And Nehemiah tells him, you know, this is all great, but I'm called actually to go do this other thing. That was countercultural. People in the royal household didn't do these kinds of things, and yet God said, you, you gotta go do this. Then think about where he was going. They had a culture too. In Jerusalem, with the walls down, there was dysfunction, okay? There was distress. There was pettiness. There was power struggles, all these things. Nehemiah is going into a dysfunctional culture and he's not gonna succumb to the dysfunctional culture. When we follow the Lord and we're doing a work he's given us to build the kingdom, we may go against the cultural flow. What does it look like in your life now? Maybe it's how you talk, what you watch, what you do, how you conduct yourselves at work, how you are in school, how you are with your children in school and the PTA or anything. There's a way this culture approves of and talks about things, and we don't give in to it as believers because we follow God's holy word, and that's going to be against the flow often, just like Nehemiah. And then you know what? On the journey, as things get built and it begins to take shape, you're going to have new ideas come to you. Innovations come into play, and they're not things you, you knew at the start but as you went down the road, you're going, okay, we need something for that. Oh, here comes something. And you know what? These three things together, let's try this. And before you know it, it's just beautiful the way new ideas and innovations come into play. And all of this helps your wisdom grow. The trial and error, the learning as you go along, the looking for the next thing, not being afraid to fail. Following the Lord, your wisdom grows. And I know about how this works with a wall. Not an actual wall, but the challenge in your life. Many years ago, I was a bachelor's level counselor at the Tuolumne County Mental Health Department. And I was one of two or three, but there was like seven or eight more that were master's level, and five of those or so were licensed, meaning they could do private work. And in private work, they could do whatever they wanted. I liked that, I admired it, I liked my work, but I was already enrolled in a master's in public administration program at Cal State Stanislaus. Somebody shout out the nickname. Turkey Tech. Turkey Tech. You have it. 
I had confirmation from a young person in the first service that it's still called Turkey Tech. They raise turkeys around there. And I was doing well in the program, meaning I got the grades, I got the work done, and the professor liked my work. I wasn't happy. I didn't feel called to it. I did it because I was raised on, you know what you need, kid? My parents, you need a good job, a government job. Benefits, a regular check, and retirement. Why? None of my family had graduated from high school. They worked hard. I, I, first eight years, I was raised in a four-room home, barely getting by. And that sunk deep into me. I need a government job. I got to get a regular job. I got to secure all this. And I wasn't happy. And so there I am in Groveland, California, coming down old priest grade road, and it's tearing me up, and I pull over. I said, Lord God, I, speak to me. I'm torn up about this. What do you want? What, I'm in a program. Why isn't it working? And I just prayed, and I was quiet. And something happened that's only really happened five or six times in my life. I got the message. Complete, full, unmistakable message from God. All the rest of my messages are 5149 to 199. I kind of live in there, going, oh, I don't know, I guess I should. This one came, and he said, I want you to counsel. That's what I want you to do. I want you to get a license. In fact, I want you maybe someday build following me into your professional practice. I went, okay. Well, that's, I drove home, I was like, yeah, who? All right, I know. I go to my buddy, Walt. He's my coworker at mental health, and he's already in a graduate program to get a master's in counseling that leads him to what was called the MFCC, Marriage Family Child, or Marriage Child Counselor. MFCC, Marriage Family Child Counselor. It's changed to Marriage Family Therapist now. And I said, well, Walt, good news. I'm gonna sign up and join with you. He goes, oh, you can't, D. Why not? Well, we already started. And you go together, the group goes together through this kind of a program, you do it all together. And we're just finishing the first semester and it's summertime and the new group doesn't start for a year. I said, well, yeah, I hear all that, but see, God, I prayed and I, this is what I'm supposed to do, so. <laughs> so, uh, we gotta do it. And he goes, well, I don't think they lot. And I said, are there rules against it? Well, not that I know of. I said, who's the director? He gave me the director's name and I called him up and said, oh, my name's Dennis, you know Walt, he's in the program. I'm supposed to be in this program. He goes, well, you can at already I heard all that. But I'm supposed to be in this program, so what do we need to do? Well, it's not been done. I said, are there rules against joining late? Well, I guess no rules, but it just, nobody does that. And I said, all right, right, just listen to me. What if I design my own curriculum for the first two classes? And over the summer, because they're on break, I did all the stuff on the curriculum. And you'd approve the curriculum. I sent it to you for approval. And at the end of that, you said, well, I guess you did it. Would you be open? He goes, all right, whatever. I was just <laughs> pounding him, you know? And I did it. At the end of the summer, he goes, well, I'll be dang. Paid the money and I joined him. Because it was a call. I wasn't confused at all. I knew exactly what I was gonna do. So they're gonna have to kill me to get me to stop kind of a thing. I know what that's like. You know what else a call looks like? You wanna know what a call looks like? Look around you. See, look at, the, look at the screens. Look at this building. You're sitting in a result of a call. Howie and Linda Hugo, many years ago, we're going to celebrate it soon, the anniversary of this church, 25th. They're happy in their home, their business, their church up on the peninsula, but God put it on their hearts. They were so clear. You're supposed to create a church for people who don't normally want to go to church. That was the initial call. And they prayed and they wrestled and they looked all over California and Oregon and Nevada. They even went inland, Arizona, you know, nothing. Nothing was coming. Nothing came. And they were just, ah, oh, we got to get away. We need a break. Let's go down to Monterey and just walk on the beach and pray and see what happens. And while they're on the beach, God said, here. What? what are you we're just here for a getaway. God said, here. The call is unmistakable. And the obstacles started, and the conflict started. How do you do this? And, and he had contacted some local pastors to say, you know what, we got a vision, we're coming down, we want to do this, and they said, don't come, we don't need you. You know how he at all, he said, great, I'll be there. <laughs> Everybody knows how he knows that. 
you're sitting in the result of a call. You saw another form of the call in the Hoffman's video. They had no idea they'd ever be directed to go to Korea. They weren't praying for it, wishing it, wanting it, or anything. And here they're told, you got to go. And they're like, what? And yet, they've prayed, they've adapted. It's become their norm now. They're already experiencing transformation and small victories. And a lot more of that is to come. There's another surprise that comes when we follow what God has led us and pulled us and pushed us to do. Victory is not a one-time thing. That's a trap. Victory is not a one-time thing. We must continue to sustain. If you got right and fill-ins, write these in. I forgot to tell you that in the slide before, but go ahead. Sustain and grow. Any victory, transforming victory, has to be sustained and grown. If we don't, anything left alone will decline. That's the nature of the world, nature of us, nature of our minds and the things around us. It will decline. And we must refresh and remind. Refresh. Remind isn't a one-time thing. Refresh means consistently. Nehemiah learned this the hard way. In chapter 13, he describes it. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. He went back to his job. He was on leave of absence. He went back to his job. And sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil things Eliashib had done. What happened? Well, you can read more of this on your own in chapter 13 of Nehemiah. But here's what happened. Once he left Jerusalem, people defaulted, reverted to form, which was self-interest and sin and power struggles. And, and everything that Nehemiah had helped build under the Lord's empowering and guidance began to fall apart. Everything began to fall apart. There was no plan to sustain it and grow it. So it went into decline. They had to have something there to refresh and remind and that hadn't happened. So Nehemiah had to go back and address the decline, as do we. I really like how Peter puts it in the first chapter of 2 Peter. This is the last thing Peter ever wrote. The second, second Peter is the last letter he ever wrote. And in the letter, we realize that he knows his time is short. And in the context of this verse, these verses, he has his people that he's doing life and ministry with around him. They're in this together, and this is what he says to them. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established, established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know I will soon put it aside, as our Lord Jesus Christ had made clear to me. The Lord told him, Peter, your time's drawing to a close. He's trying to impart to them powerful things that are critical for them to keep going forward and sustain and grow what they've already begun. You see? And they're in scripture because they're for us today, right now. I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. He put something into place for them, for their benefit, because he understood how this worked. Even when I'm gone, there'll be things in place so you will refresh and remind, refresh and remind, sustain and grow. And I know how this works personally. Many years ago, through a friend, I met with a missionary from Guatemala who had a particular vision. And he'd already begun construction on this vision in the highlands of Guatemala. Uh, but it needed a great deal more work. And it was a school for Mayan children in the village of Pishiba at 9,000 feet and higher in elevation. And I prayed about it, saw his pictures and, 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 and talked to Pastor Howie at the time and said, you know, I think we're supposed to go. I took a team down there, Phil Choate, Pastor Keith went with us, and we worked on this three-story school on the side of a hill with green lumber. If you know construction, green lumber, wet. Every time you hit a nail, water goes that way. Two or three times are more heavier than regular wood, and we're walking up ramps to build this thing because we believed, and the vision was beautiful and clear and from the Lord. 
and we worked and worked, and we got almost everything about that school done and rewarded us that we were serving and working hard, and we got to meet the children of the village. They were lovely. They come right to you, want to hold you, want to hold your hand, walk with you, sing together, play together. Just, oh, it's just beautiful. And so the team went home with the cup overflowing. A couple years later, Pastor John, who was our global outreach uh, pastor then, calls back down and says, what do you need? And Carlos, the guy whose vision we were following, said, you know what? The building needs some help. Can you bring a team? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll bring a team down. And we did. We did. Let's take a look here. That's one of our team members. When we painted and did things, that's not OSHA certified, by the way. We had Pete Lee up on top of one roof with a girl named Jenny hanging 35 feet down, and he's belaying her from the roof so she doesn't fall to her death. And then, that's what it looked like when we were done. It goes way far to the right. And then, these are the children. They all have uniforms. And it was beautiful. A beautiful vision made real. A beautiful call on Carlos's heart. And then, this is the patio where we would share devotions and stuff in mourning at the end of the day. And uh, we were allowed to put the shoreline name up there. So everybody there had their cup full to overflowing. We come back to California, back to shoreline, just rich, knowing great things are happening. We call down there a year or two later, can't get a hold of the director. Call down again a year or two later, can't get a hold of him. Finally find a way to get a hold of him. Carlos, whose man was, who was the man following the vision that the Lord put on his heart. Finally, we got a hold of him. We said, we want to come down and see the school. He goes, yeah, I think you should. So we go down and we meet, we meet with him. He'd begun a new business in the town of Antigua, which is a tourist spot in Guatemala. And we said, okay, will you drive up with us? Yes, and we went up there. The school was closed. The road was washed out. The building was falling in, into disrepair and it wasn't being used anymore. There's nothing like it in the highlands of Guatemala, nothing. And it was over. Now, hear me. His vision was good and right and strong and the school did powerful work and it was great for the teams that came. But it ended, and, that, and nothing will change that. But it ended because there was not a vision and a plan to sustain and grow the work. And it was heart-wrenching for everyone who was on that mission and the missions to that thing. What's your wall? What's the challenge in front of you? What's the challenge that God is putting on your heart to be some part of building the kingdom? The kingdom of the Lord through the covenant with Jesus, that Jesus Christ brought the new covenant. What's your part? What's the resistance? Where's the opposition? What will you gain? What would your victory look like? Why does it matter so much? Ask yourself that. I got some things I want you to take home with you today. Number one, doing great things for God does not require you to be employed in ministry. You, all you do is make yourself available right where you are and ask him if you haven't already. Many of you are already following. Praise God, that's great. But if you're not there yet, right where you are is just fine with God. He's got something for it. He promises in Ephesians 2.10, we are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. So there's something for you. Number two, recognize and respond when you feel God's tug. It may be a nuance, a subtle pull or a push or a leading or something. It may not be the grand sky riding kind of this is what you should do thing. It doesn't have to be. But recognize and respond and make sure it's something worth fighting for. You know why that's so important? Because if it's not, how long will you fight the obstacles and the conflicts? You won't. That's how we are. So make sure it's something worth fighting for, small or grand. And be ready for trouble and deal with it immediately. We get surprised by the trouble. We hear about it. We shouldn't be surprised, yet we still are surprised. So I, and deal with it immediately. Here's what I say, and I say this to myself. When you avoid a problem, you compound the problem. When you avoid a problem, you compound the problem. It doesn't sit there like it was before. It's bigger and bigger and bigger. So get right into it. 
right away, just dig in and get after it. And sacrifice is part of the deal. What's it worth if there's no sacrifice? What meaning does it have? It should cost you something. It should cost you something. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. We learn from that. And now stay honest with yourself and God. You know, there's this tendency at time to think, well, I'm kind of honest, and I know he knows everything, but I really kind of think he doesn't kind of know this stuff I'm into, and this stuff I think, and this stuff I do, but I kind of know that he knows. And, we, and, and you know what he wants? He wants it to be an interaction with him. He does know, sure he does, but there's something even more powerful about you saying, all right, I'm gonna give it up to you. Here it is as I know it. This is me, Lord. Be honest with yourself and God, and then follow through. See, here's the thing. If you know ahead of time that a call's been given to you, and you're, it, maybe it's in the moment you saw a big documentary on working in the third world country, and you feel like, I'm in, I'm called. Could I, could I encourage you to hesitate? Wait a little bit, pray. Because if you say, I'm going to go do this, and you don't follow through, here's what happens. Other people's trust who may have heard this from you, their trust in you will be bruised a bit, damaged a bit. Next time you say it, they might think, I don't know, I guess. Secondly, it bruises your own trust in yourself. When you hear yourself say it, you might say, well, I guess I'll do it. It's better if you're not certain to say, I'm not certain. It's better if you're not sure to say, I'm not sure. If you don't know, say, I don't know. If you think, well, maybe I'd like to, but I'm not sure, just say that. It doesn't bruise anybody's trust if you say that. And last, watch what God does. He is ready to do things in your life that will surprise you and amaze you. He's been doing it forever, since the beginning of recorded history. And he's doing it right now today. And he may already be doing it in your life. But be ready to see what he does in you and through you. Watch what he does. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you, Father, that your Bible is just the best thing ever. Because we can learn who we are. We can learn what to do. We can learn how to live. We can learn about what meaning and purpose is. We can learn how to be part of building your kingdom which is a kingdom of hope, light, and joy, and reconciliation through Jesus Christ. Let us be aware and respond when you call us to serve with the purposes you've prepared in advance for us to do. We thank you for this opportunity. And we pray all this in the name of the one who loves us best, Jesus Christ. Amen.